Chapter 4. Margaret Beaufort. It was in the beginning of the troubled times of the Wars of the Roses that Margaret Beaufort was born. Her father, the Duke of Somerset, was one of the great nobles on the Lancastrian side. He was the grandson of John of Gaunt, son of Edward III, and Duke of Lancaster, who had married a rich and noble heiress. Margaret was born in 1441 in her mother's manor of Bletsoe in Bedfordshire. Only three years after her birth, her father died, and the little girl, his only child, was left heiress to vast estates and riches. She passed the early years of her life at Bletsoe with her mother. Great care seems to have been given to Margaret's education. It was not common in those days for girls even to be taught to write, but Margaret was bred in studious habits. She knew French perfectly and also some Latin, but in later life regretted that she had not been able to gain a fuller knowledge of that language. She was very clever with her needle and is known to have executed beautiful embroidery. Above all, she was well taught in religion and trained in habits of piety. But the condition of a great heiress was far from agreeable in those days. It was the custom to give her to some great noble as his ward, and he then had the right to arrange for her marriage as he liked. When Margaret was nine years old, the king gave her as ward to the Duke of Suffolk, one of the most powerful men of the time, and he had her brought to court and wished to marry her to his son. But the King Henry the Sixth wanted her to marry his half-brother, Edmund Tudor, Earl of Richmond. Margaret was puzzled by these different proposals and asked the advice of an old lady whom she dearly loved. The old lady bade her ask St. Nicholas, a saint who was thought to care especially for young girls, to help her in this difficult matter. Margaret prayed often to St. Nicholas, and one night, whether she was awake or asleep, she did not know, St. Nicholas in the dress of a bishop appeared before her and told her to take Edmund Tudor as her husband. This dream seems to have decided the choice of her mother, and as shortly afterwards the Duke of Suffolk fell into disgrace, it came about that Margaret was allowed to marry Edmund Tudor when she was not quite fifteen years old. After her marriage, she went with her husband to live at his castle at Pembroke in Wales, his native country. Only a year afterwards, he died, and a few weeks after his death, her son Henry was born. At the age of sixteen, only a child herself, she was left a widow with a child to take care of. The baby was small and weakly, and to it Margaret gave all her care. It was an anxious time for the members of the Lancastrian family. Their rivals, the Yorkists, were beginning to rise into power, and the little Henry, both on account of his great possessions and because through his descent from John of Gaunt he was so nearly related to King Henry the Sixth, was not likely to find them friendly to him and his mother. Margaret was glad to stay in quiet seclusion at Pembroke Castle under the protection of Jasper Tudor, her husband's brother, now owner of the castle. Even had he wished, Henry the Sixth could not have befriended her. He was powerless, sometimes in the hands of those who called themselves his friends, sometimes flying before his enemies, whilst the country was distracted with the struggles of the Yorkists and the Lancastrians. Margaret thought it best to seek a protector for herself and her son by marrying Lord Henry Stafford. When Henry the Sixth was in power, she and her son were able to visit the court, but at other times she was only safe in her castle in Wales. At last Edward of York became king as Edward the Fourth, and Henry the Sixth was cast as a prisoner into the tower. Edward the Fourth seized the lands belonging to the little Henry, and his mother feared lest even his life might not be safe. So she was willing that he should escape to France under the care of his uncle Jasper. Henry was then fourteen. Margaret had watched anxiously over his delicate childhood, moving him about to different places in Wales for the good of his health. He was an intelligent boy, and once when his uncle Jasper had taken him to court to see Henry the Sixth, 
the king is reported to have said when he looked at him surely this is he to whom both we and our adversaries shall hereafter give place his tutor said that he had never seen a boy of so much quickness and learning but now the poor boy had to leave his mother and his country the wind drove him and jasper to land on the coast of brittany and when the duke of brittany heard of their arrival he ordered them to be brought to his castle at vannes there he kept henry as a sort of prisoner but refused to give him up to edward the fourth and though not allowed to leave vannes he was at least safe for fourteen years henry was obliged to remain in brittany separated from his mother the yorkist king edward the fourth was on the throne and margaret separated from her son lived as quietly as possible in her estates in the country anxious to save what she could of her money and her lands for henry she seems to have stayed in different parts of the country wherever she lived she devoted herself to the care of the poor and the good of the church staying at one of her houses in devonshire she found that the priest's house was at some distance from the church so that he had some way to walk to and fro she therefore presented to the church for ever her own manor house with the land around it for the priest's use as it was close to the church she lived chiefly at collie weston in northamptonshire where she built herself a fine house she was deeply religious and during these long years she spent much of her time in prayer she used to get up at five o'clock and spend the hours till ten which was in those days the hour for dinner in meditation and prayer the rest of the day she spent partly in ministering to the wants of the poor and sick partly in study books in those days just before the introduction of printing were scarce and precious margaret busied herself with translating into english some books of devotion from the french amongst other things she was the first to translate into english part of that famous book the imitation by thomas a kempis which has helped and comforted so many people we know little of her second husband and do not know how much he was with her he died after they had been married twenty-two years and in his will he spoke of margaret with warm love and trust shortly after his death margaret married for a third time lord stanley himself a widower with a large family and one of the most powerful nobles at the court of edward the fourth in those days great people married more from policy than from love margaret probably felt that now that it seemed as if the power of the yorkists was established it would be well for her to gain the protection of a powerful noble at court who might in time help to make it possible for her son to return to england she now left her quiet life and came to live in a great house in london belonging to her husband very shortly afterwards everything was changed by the unexpected death of edward the fourth when his brother the duke of gloucester made himself king as richard the third and caused his little nephews to be murdered in the tower there was such discontent in england that it seemed to the friends of the house of lancaster a good opportunity to destroy the yorkist power margaret's son henry as the descendant of john of gaunt was the chief representative of the house of lancaster a plan was made to make him king and marry him to elizabeth the beautiful young daughter of edward the fourth the duke of buckingham one of the chief nobles of the time and till now a friend and supporter of richard the third was one of the chief movers in this plot margaret was travelling one day on the road between bridge north and worcester on her way to visit a special shrine at worcester when she chanced to meet the duke of buckingham journeying from tewkesbury he told her of the proposed plot and she was naturally eager to help in anything which might bring back her son to her reginald bray a discreet man who was in margaret's service and helped in looking after her estates was employed in communicating with henry the young prince found many friends and a fleet was got together to bring him to england but after he had started a mighty storm arose scattered his ships and drove him back to the coast of france with such fury that he narrowly escaped with his life 
for the moment all seemed lost. Richard III's suspicions were thoroughly aroused. He knew that Margaret had been communicating with her son, and he was very angry with her. But he did not dare to anger her powerful husband, Lord Stanley, by treating her too severely. He bade Stanley keep her safely in some secret place at home, without any servant or company, so that she might have no means of communicating with her son. Stanley himself was really in Henry's favour, and Richard, beginning to suspect him, seized his eldest son and kept him as a hostage for his father. Somehow communications with Henry still went on, and in 1485 he landed in Wales, and all men flocked to join him. Stanley, who pretended to keep faith to Richard to the last, deserted him just before the Battle of Bosworth, where Richard was utterly defeated and killed. His crown was found hanging in a bush by Reginald Bray and brought to Stanley, who placed it on the head of Henry, crying, Long live King Henry the Seventh. It seems likely that Henry first met his mother at Leicester after the battle. She had parted with him fifteen years before, when he was a boy of fourteen. She met him again as King of England. The right that Henry had to the throne came to him through his mother, she might have claimed to be queen herself, but she never thought of doing this, nor did she try to take any part in public affairs. Of course, all her lands were restored to her, and she was called at court the full noble Princess Margaret, Countess of Richmond, mother of our sovereign lord, the king. She now for the most part lived in her manner of woking in Surrey, coming to court only on important occasions. Henry married Elizabeth, the tall, golden-haired daughter of Edward IV, a few months after he became king, and Margaret seems to have been with her on all important occasions. Perhaps she may have domineered over her a little too much, for the Spanish envoy reported to his court that Elizabeth was a very noble woman and much beloved, but that she was kept in subjection by her mother-in-law, the Countess of Richmond. At any rate, Margaret was by her side on all great occasions. Together they watched from behind a lattice the coronation of Henry at Westminster Abbey and the banquet afterwards in Westminster Hall. Together they went in state in a barge to Greenwich to see a water fete arranged by the Lord Mayor in honour of the King's coronation, where, among other shows, they watched a dragon which was carried along in a barge and spouted fire into the Thames. Henry the Seventh always treated his mother with great consideration. Margaret seems to have been an authority on matters of etiquette, for before the birth of his first child, Henry asked her to draw up a set of rules about the ceremonies to be observed on the occasion. In these rules it is stated that there were to be two cradles of tree, meaning of wood, one large for state occasions to be adorned with paintings and furnished with cloth of gold and ermine fur and crimson velvet. At its christening, the child was to carry a little taper in its hand, and two hundred torches were to be borne before it to the altar. After the baptism, the torches and the little taper were to be lit, and the child was to present the taper at the altar. It looks as if the love for grand ceremonies which distinguished the Tudors had been started by Margaret. Her own household was beautifully ordered. She had drawn up a set of rules for the guidance of all the servants and the ladies and gentlemen who made up her household, and these rules were read aloud four times a year, that all might know and observe them. She visited in turn all her different estates, spending some time at each, so that she might see that each was well ordered, and hear the complaints of all those who had any grievances. She herself would constantly speak loving words of encouragement to her servants, bidding them all to do well and to live in peace with one another. She employed a band of minstrels of her own who would sometimes wander round the country and perform before the king and the court. As was the custom in those days, many young gentlemen were educated in her household. Her care of the sick and suffering never failed. She would minister to them with her own hands, and twelve poor folk to whom she gave food and raiment lodged constantly in her house. Neither did Margaret forget her interest in study, 
We are told by Bishop Fisher, who knew her well, that she was of singular wisdom, far surpassing the common rate of women. She collected a great number of books, both English and French, and she was a warm friend of William Caxton, who first introduced printing into England, and who dedicated a book to her, which he said had been translated from the French at her request. After Caxton's death in 1496, his assistant, Winken de Word, became the chief printer in London. He was much favoured by Margaret, and allowed to call himself printer unto the most excellent princess, my lady, the king's mother. He published books for Margaret, and amongst others, one which she had herself translated from the French. Margaret had always been a deeply religious woman, and with growing years, she gave ever more time to her religious observances. Many hours were spent in prayer and in services in her chapel. She observed strictly all the fasts ordained by the church, which were very severe in those days, and she wore on certain days in each week a hair shirt or a hair girdle next her skin in order to mortify her flesh. In 1497, Margaret appointed a learned Cambridge scholar, John Fisher, whom she had noticed with favor at court, where he had come on business connected with his university, to be her confessor. Fisher gained great influence over her, and he used it for the good of his university, which was then by no means in a prosperous condition. Margaret was always generous with her money. Fisher says of her that she hated avarice and covetousness, and she was glad to use her wealth to promote the cause of learning. Under Fisher's guidance, she founded professorships at Cambridge and Oxford, which are still called after her. The college where Fisher had himself studied, called God's House, was very poor, and Margaret refounded it under the name of Christ's College, and herself made the statutes under which it was to be governed. She took great interest in it, and kept some rooms in it for herself, where she might stay when she came to Cambridge. Once, when she was staying there before the building of the college was finished, she was looking out of the window when she saw the dean beating a scholar who had misbehaved. She did not interfere to stop the punishment, but only called out in Latin, Lente, Lente, gently, gently, wishing that the beating might be less severe. It was in Cambridge that the famous scholar Erasmus, met her on one of his visits to England, when she was an old lady, and admired her good memory and a ready wit. Before the buildings of Christ College were finished, Fisher won Margaret's interest in the foundation of another college, St. John's, at that time, the time which is known as the Renaissance, because art and learning seemed to be born again, men were eager to improve the teaching at the universities and to make it possible for all who wished to gain knowledge. Fisher was friends with Erasmus and other learned men, and Margaret was willing to help with her money his plans for the advancement of learning, just as she had helped Caxton and Winken de Word in printing and publishing books. But though for those days she was a learned woman herself, she does not seem to have thought that other women should be helped to study, and it was only the learning of men that she aided by her gifts. Henry the Seventh was interested in his mother's plans and himself visited Cambridge to see her college. He also thought highly of Fisher and named him Bishop of Rochester. There seems to have been a deep affection between Henry and his mother. Once in writing to her toward the end of his life, he says that he has bounden to her for the great and singularly motherly love and affection that she has always had for him. In writing to the king, Margaret called him my own sweet and most dear king, and all my worldly joy, and often addressed him as my dear heart. She had the sorrow of seeing him die before her, but she did not live many months after him. She suffered greatly from rheumatic pains in what Bishop Fisher calls her merciful and loving hands, so that her ladies and servants wept to see her agony. She died at Westminster and was buried in Henry the Seventh's chapel in Westminster Abbey, where a black marble tomb commemorates her memory. Bishop Fisher preached her funeral sermon and said in it, All England for her death had cause of weeping. The poor creatures that were wont to receive her alms 
to whom she was always piteous and merciful, the students of both universities, to whom she was a mother, all the learned men of England, to whom she was a very patroness, all the good religious men and women, whom she so often was wont to visit and comfort. Margaret's plans for the foundation of St. John's College were not finished at her death, and Wolsey, the favourite of her grandson, Henry the Eighth, tried to get her lands for other purposes. Fisher's efforts succeeded in keeping a great deal for St. John's, though not as much as Margaret had meant to give. She left all her jewels, books, vestments, plate, and altar cloths to her two colleges. She had been especially fond of fine goldsmith's work, and many beautiful things had been made for her, adorned with her own emblem, a daisy, or with the rose and the portcullis, which through her descent from the Lancaster and Beaufort families became the Tudor emblems. Besides her colleges, she founded several almshouses and a school at Wimborne, where her parents were buried. She used her great possessions as a trust, which she held for the good of the country, and for herself sought no luxury or display, being, as Bishop Fisher says in his sermon, temperate in meats and drinks, eschewing banquets, and keeping fast days. End of section 6